What if the most important research station for Earth isn't on Earth at all? Not in Antarctica, not on mountaintops, but kilometers beneath the surface. Deep underwater, where pressure builds like a silent vice, where currents tear through steel, and storms rage above with the force of giants. So how do you build anything beneath the waves and keep it alive? From habitats that already exist to megastructures straight out of science fiction, these are the most extreme underwater stations on Earth. From drifting towers that follow the currents to manta-shaped campuses designed to teach the ocean itself. Our journey begins off the coast of Curaçao, where an ambitious project called Proteus is aiming to become the ocean's equivalent of the International Space Station. At first glance, it looks like something out of a science fiction movie, a futuristic ring of pods resting on stilts above the seafloor. Each pod has a purpose. Laboratories, living quarters, medical bays, a moon pool for diving, even a greenhouse for growing fresh food. The entire complex will cover around 4,000 square meters, making it the largest underwater habitat ever conceived. Up to 12 people will be able to live and work here at a time, staying submerged for weeks, even months without surfacing. Inside, Proteus feels more like a space station than a lab. Sleek pods, smart lighting to mimic the sun's daily cycle, quiet areas for mental health, and wide observation windows to look out into the blue. Engineers know that when you put 12 people in a pressure capsule for 30 days, psychology matters as much as engineering. How is the crew's living condition underwater? There were sleeping quarters for a crew of 12, a kitchen where divers eat together after six-hour missions, even a greenhouse that uses filtered sunlight to grow food beneath the waves. Days here won't be measured by clocks, but by dive schedules, oxygen supplies, and the rhythm of the sea outside. But Proteus isn't just about science, it's also a broadcast hub. High bandwidth communications will beam live video from the seafloor straight to classrooms, universities, and media networks around the world. For the first time, millions could watch ocean life as it actually happens. Coral spawning, predators hunting, plankton blooms lighting up the night. How exactly will this bold vision be turned into reality? Proteus will be prefabricated on land with modular pods built in shipyards, then lowered into the water and fixed to steel stilts anchored in the seabed. Composite materials resistant to saltwater corrosion, advanced ceiling rings, and pressurated glass will make it possible to keep the habitat safe for decades. Once assembled, the station will be powered by a hybrid of solar, wind, and ocean thermal energy. If finished by 2028, it would be the largest, most advanced underwater habitat ever constructed. If Proteus is bold, the sentinel habitat from a UK company called Deep is radical. Instead of one large station, Deep imagines a whole network of modular capsules, habitats, labs, and dormitories that can be docked together like Lego blocks on the seafloor. The price? $300 million. By 2027, Deep plans to have its first pilot habitat named Vanguard in the water. But for now, the testing ground is unusual a flooded quarry in Wales. There, engineers are practicing how to assemble, test, and live in these habitats before they ever hit the open sea. The vision is clear, not just short missions, but permanent human presence under the ocean. The most striking difference is depth. While Proteus sits in shallow waters, Deep's modules are being designed for depths of up to 200 meters. At that pressure, steel groans, seals are tested to the limit, and every system must work perfectly. Each module is built like a subsea spacecraft, pressurated hulls, advanced life support, renewable power, and docking ports to expand or detach. One station could be a science lab, another a training dorm, a third a robotics garage. Together, they form a subsea city that can grow as needed. Why 200 meters? Because that's where some of the most interesting ecosystems live, the twilight zone of the ocean, where light fades, but life flourishes in strange forms. Sentinel modules are designed to be built in specialized dry docks, pressure tested in controlled environments, and then lowered into the ocean in segments. Each pod would be titanium reinforced with composite shells, connected by pressurized tunnels. Ballast systems would keep them stable, while modular anchoring plates would allow relocation if conditions change. 
Essentially, they're designed to be the first movable cities under the ocean. If it works, Deep Sentinel could be the world's first step towards subsea colonization, a place where people don't just research the sea, they actually become part of it. Not all underwater stations are visions of the future. Some already exist and have survived for decades, like the Aquarius Reef Base. Built in 1986 and relocated to Florida in 1993, Aquarius currently is the world's only operational undersea station. It sits 19 meters below the surface off Key Largo, resting on stilts beside a coral reef. From the outside, it's just a steel cylinder. Inside, it's a world of bunks, workbenches, and humming life support systems. A crew of six can live here for weeks, working long days outside in the water. The secret is saturation diving. Living under pressure, aquanauts can spend up to 10 hours a day underwater. At the end of the mission, they undergo a single, carefully managed decompression. That's how astronauts train here. NASA sends crews to Aquarius to practice living in isolation, handling stress, and performing extravehicular activities in a hostile environment. Life inside Aquarius is basic. Tight quarters, recycled air, limited communications. Fresh food is rare, and the view through the porthole is mostly fish and blue water. But for marine science, it's invaluable. Researchers have studied coral health, reef fish behavior, even medicine from sponges, all thanks to Aquarius. Aquarius was built by constructing a steel pressure vessel on land, then submerging and anchoring it to the seabed. Its hull is continuously maintained against rust, with divers welding and sealing worn parts. The habitat is supplied by an umbilical line to a shore-based control center, delivering power, air, and data. Despite being over 30 years old, constant upgrades have kept it alive, proving that, with enough maintenance, underwater habitats can endure. It may not look like much compared to glossy renderings, but Aquarius proves something vital. Humans can live and work under the sea. It's the foundation that every future project stands on. Now, let's shift from what exists to what might. Imagine a floating sphere on the surface wide enough to hold skyscrapers, connected to the seabed by a massive spiral, corkscrewing into the depths. This is Ocean Spiral a concept by Shimizu Corporation in Japan. Inside the sphere, enough space for 5,000 residents, apartments, schools, laboratories, even agriculture zones. The spiral itself would generate power by tapping into temperature differences between shallow and deep water, a form of ocean thermal energy. It's a bold idea, not just a station, but an underwater city, a city that grows its own food, generates its own energy, and lives permanently in the sea. Of course, the challenges are enormous. The costs would run into the tens of billions. Materials strong enough to last decades under pressure and corrosion don't even exist yet at the required scale. Engineers propose building its sections in massive floating dry docks using carbon fiber composites and high-pressure steel. The spiral would be constructed in segments each anchored progressively deeper using tension light platforms, similar to offshore oil rigs, but magnitudes larger. The project is estimated to cost tens of billions, and no country has yet committed to building it, but the design is a blueprint for how an oceanic megacity might someday rise. And then there's the question of whether people would even want to live in such an environment long term. Some stations don't want to be cities, they want to be explorers. Enter Sea Orbiter, designed by French architect Jacques Ruggieri. Half ship, half space station, this vertical tower would drift with ocean currents, acting as a mobile observatory of the seas. Above the surface rise antennas, satellite dishes, and solar panels. Below the surface hang research decks, diver docks, and observation windows stretching down 30 meters into the blue. Sea Orbiter's idea is simple. Don't fight the ocean flow with it. By drifting, the station can study marine ecosystems without anchoring, monitor plankton blooms, or follow fish migrations for thousands of kilometers. Sea Orbiter's hull is envisioned in aluminum magnesium alloy, light enough to float, yet strong against corrosion. The vessel would be built in shipyards like a traditional vessel, then launched like a ship, but with specialized ballast systems to maintain its vertical posture. 
Construction of smaller prototypes has begun, but the full-scale vision still waits for funding. If realized, it would be the closest thing humanity has built to a true starship of the sea. Like so many ambitious projects, funding has been its biggest challenge. Only partial prototypes have ever been built, but if it is ever realized, Sea Orbiter could become the most recognizable ocean platform in history, the Eiffel Tower of the Sea, drifting silently across the waves. From Florida's steel survivor to Curaçao's Proteus, from modular sentinels to entire ocean cities, these stations are proof that humans are no longer content with visiting the sea. We want to live there. Some of these habitats are already real. Others are still blueprints and dreams. But together, they all raise the same question. If we can build space stations in orbit, why not in the ocean that covers 70% of our planet? Because in the end, the ocean is just as much a frontier as space. It demands new engineering, new ways of living, and new courage. But humanity isn't only pushing boundaries beneath the waves. Far to the south, in the frozen heart of Antarctica, China is building one of the most advanced polar research bases on Earth the Qinling Station, a base designed to withstand brutal winds, shifting ice, and months of isolation. And just like these undersea habitats, it's not only about survival. It's about strategy, science, and the future of how we explore the extremes of our planet. If you don't want to get drowned in the deep sea, click here to watch our story of Qinling Station.